All right, so now in this session, we're going to be taking a deeper look at spirit, soul, and body. Now, some of you recall that last night I talked to some degree about these things, but today we're going to dig deeper and we're going to ask some really uh, important questions that I, I think the takeaway, our, our heart in this, is that we see that God embraces us fully, that he embraces every aspect of who we are, and that we're not left with any misunderstandings about spirit, soul, and body. So uh, first we want to present this, just if you're not familiar with spirit, soul, and body, you can see that the spirit is the centermost part of us, and then we have the soul, which could be referred to as our personality. You'll notice that our mind, our will, and our emotions are housed in the soul. And in the Greek, this word is suke. This is where we get our word psychology from. So you could say that your soul is your psychology, uh, whereas earlier we learned that spirit is pneuma, and this is where God lives. He lives in our spirit. But notice that your spirit is different than the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is who God is, but the Holy Spirit came and took residence in your human spirit. So you have a human spirit, a human soul, and a human body. Now, you'll notice that the life of God, this triangle represents the Trinity, and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the life of God is with us and in us, as John 14 says, we will come to him, and you notice it's a big we. We collectively will come to him and make our home with him. Now, lastly, I know this is very familiar territory for many of us in the room, but I just wanna highlight the power of sin has an effect on us, and you'll notice that that little oval shape at the bottom there is the power of sin. And sin is in the world, but sin also has access to us through the brain, through the human body, through the five senses. We are connected to this physical world. And when sin entered into the world, that's how we get tempted, is by this power of sin. Um, Tim, talk to us about this dotted line what that represents and, and why it's not solid. So the dotted line would represent the flesh. So the, the sin has the power source, but it makes its avenue and access to us through these through the flesh patterns that we each uniquely have, right? And so our flesh is represented as a dotted line because it's not solid, because it, it's not who you are. It's not to be identified with, but it's to be recognized as something you have, but not to be identified with. Awesome, and I love the way you put it. You know, sin is the power, and flesh is the pattern. The pattern, the highway, the route that sin has traveled over the years. All right, so uh, the last thing we want to say here is notice that um, when you choose good works that are from the Holy Spirit, that emanates out of the center of your being, whereas when we commit sins, they're not coming from our core. All right, so now we want to jump into the first question, and that is, you know, is self uh, a dirty word for the believer? And, you know, I talked about this briefly. We don't need to uh, belabor it too long, but we basically came to the conclusion that self, you know, strangely, self is not a dirty word for the believer. Traditionally, though, Tim, we have looked at self as something that we need to push down, get out of the way, get rid of. And so what are your thoughts on why self is not a dirty word? Well, because God gave us a new one, right? We have a new self and it is, we're just one self. We don't have two selves. The old self that was dirty has been crucified and God doesn't do anything with a sinner but crucify him. The only thing God can do with a sinner is crucify that sinner. And he resurrects a brand new self. So self now has been redeemed for us as believers. We get to enjoy the new self. Uh, we just took a trip to Nicaragua a few months ago. And in this, uh, in this city where we went and ministered, 
there's actually a dump site, a, a trash pile. And in this dump site, some of the orphans of that community have made their home there because they have nothing. And so they make their abode, they live off the trash of this dump site. And when I was there and looking at this and thinking about how we look sometimes at our own selves, and we have made self a dirty word sometimes, maybe even inadvertently. But if self is a dirty word, I looked at that dump site and I thought, who would choose to live there if they had the choice? And these orphans didn't have the choice. God has a choice where he can live. He has chosen us. He has chosen to homestead here within us. And he didn't do it in a dump. So when we walk around calling ourselves a dump or calling ourselves dirty or sinful or sinners, we are not giving him the credit he deserves for the home he would choose. He cleaned us once for all in order to inhabit us in the new self. And self is a good word. Okay, so so God cleaned house and then he moved in. I mean, that's the picture you're giving us. And that's that's beautiful to think about, you know, as you look at this diagram again, uh, you know, basically we're saying God is blue and so are you. Right? You see that? God is happy now. Yeah, not not, not down. Right. Blue. No, thanks for clarifying that. Sure. That's good. But yeah, the, the, the color of God in this, in this diagram is blue. And let's, for, for the sake of, of this, let's let that represent his nature, his character, what he's like. And then what we're finding is that we're compatible. We're compatible with him. God is blue, and so are you. Okay, so then what about the idea of selfish? So it's fair to ask this question. We just said the self is new. It's good. We can embrace our new self. That's a good thing. Then how do we explain this word selfish? Because it certainly is a negative connotation, right? I said earlier, I, I believe that the old self has the characteristic of being selfish. It's about itself. But we've been redeemed from that. We've been made brand new. We're a new self. The new self is not characterized by selfish, but selfless. <laughs> Philippians 2, it says Jesus, who although he was God, didn't Look for equality with God, something to be grasped. He humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. So we see in the example of Jesus, and we're also encouraged to have that same attitude, by the way. So we see in his example the selfless self that Jesus is. And our new self will never be at home again, living selfishly, only for itself. It's a life unto others. So selfish is a negative word, but it has nothing to do with our new self. Now, I want to go back to something you said uh, just a few minutes ago. You talked about how we're not sinners. I think, you know, we need to be really clear on this because the Bible never actually addresses believers as being sinners by nature. Yes, we sin. Anybody here not sin? All of us. I'm looking. I'm looking. You know, usually there's one that raises their hand and I say, now you have. <laughs> But, you know, the reality is, is that we've all committed sins and we will still struggle with sin, but we're not what we do. Right. We're not the sum total of our past. We're not defined by what we do. As we like to say around here, we are who we are by birth, not by behavior. Right. And that's why, you know, Paul is addressing people in, in his epistles and he says to the saints at Corinth. Well, we all know what the saints in Corinth were involved in. And sometimes it wasn't very pretty uh, to the saints in Rome, to the saints in Ephesus. So you're not going to find God addressing us as sinners, as a label. We're not sinners by nature. We are saints who sometimes sin. And that's a big deal, isn't it? As big as it gets, right? We have been so made brand new that our new identity is to identify with what Jesus has done, who he is, not even what we are presently doing. Because like Andrew said, we can still sin, but we're not to identify with that. And what do we do when that happens? Well, we chalk it up and we're forgiven. And that's the new motivation for living unto righteousness. Guilt and shame and condemnation will never be satisfactory uh, motivators to righteous living. They are the debilitators to that kind of living. So God gave us a new identity as his child, a saint, a set-apart one, righteous. We have right standing with him, 
not based on what we do, but based on what he's accomplished for us. All right, so <clears throat> let's talk about self-life. I mentioned this in passing last night, the idea of, of self-life being a term. Uh, if you've never heard this term, you've lived your Christian life without this term, that, that might be the case for many people in the room. It, it's come up in some of the, the literature over the years and some of the teaching that's out there in our community of grace. And, uh, you know, last night I was saying that I don't think it's the most accurate way to look at things. I want to really push us, I want to challenge us to revisit that. Uh, because, Tim, you know, like I was saying last night, you know, you're sharing with somebody and you're saying how great this message is. Oh, Tim, I just discovered the most beautiful news in the world. I'm a new self. My old self was crucified. Romans 6.6, 6, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The old self is gone, Tim, and now I'm a new self, but my problem is the self-life. <laughs> Right. And so the problem, if I label it that way, I think that I might just give somebody the wrong idea. I'm saying I'm the new self, but I've got a self life that's my opponent. So I've got the word, you know, self in there twice. And I end up with a, a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. I end up with a schizophrenic Christianity if I don't watch it. And I'm not saying that everybody runs away with that conclusion. But but if we you know, I think basically. We need to be sticking to what's actually in the scripture and do our best to allow God to define those terms for us with the Bible itself. Because I know I can get real creative with terminology, but if I go off the reservation with my own set of terms, then down the line, it's like the telephone game. I mean, somebody's going to get the wrong idea. Yeah. I think communication is so important. And the way we communicate this Listen, and let's just be honest. We've used this term. I have. I've used the term self-life till I begin to really understand what we're really talking about. Now, we know we're talking about the flesh. Or another term that I'll use is counterfeit life. It feels like it's offering real life, but it isn't, and it's the flesh. But to tie it to the self is going to make somebody ask, is that self really crucified? Or who are we talking about there? So I think it's just clear communication. I don't want to be a grace Pharisee in terminology. I think the right. issue is we have the life. And there are many people that are experiencing the life we're talking about, this deeper life in Jesus Christ, that don't use the same language necessarily. Right. So we can look at that and understand that and give grace to it. But I think if we're communicating, the clearer message will be not to, to mix these terms and maybe cause some confusion. Right. All right, so, uh, you know, dovetailing off of that, if we look back at the image here that we're using for, for this hour, um, you know, what we're trying to say is you'll notice that your human spirit, it's all blue. It's not half blue. It's not partially blue. It's not becoming blue. It's not going to later, you know, you're not hoping and waiting and begging and pleading to become blue in heaven. Uh, there's not a last minute polish of a blue spray that's sprayed on there like a spray tan. Smurf spray. Yeah. Ooh, that's marketable like that. Yeah. Smurf spray. I'm, I'm an expert on anything small. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So then it stands the reason we can ask this question. Is there any benefit then to analyzing the flesh? We're in a room full of many counselors. Yeah. Let's let's tread lightly and yeah. honestly. Yeah. Sure there is. Sure there is. What's the benefit of analyzing the flesh? We don't want to be in denial that we have it. Right? Because if we deny that we have the flesh, then we have to identify with whatever the flesh is presenting. And we'll say something like, I'm just a bitter person. I'm just an impatient person. I come from a long line of impatient people. And then my dad was impatient, and I'm impatient. And all of a sudden, we formed a whole identity around a flesh pattern. So the value of analyzing our flesh is to know that it's there. But then I think we quickly, as soon as we recognize it, as soon as we know that it's there and it's not who we are, we do just like Paul said. We get out of town. We press on towards Christ. We forget what is behind. Second Corinthians says we look at nobody according to the flesh. We don't form an analysis of paralysis around the flesh. We are about our Father. We're about identifying with Him. And we set our sights right there. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Notice it doesn't say 
Fix your eyes on not walking after the flesh. It says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Walk in the spirit and you will not satisfy the desire of the flesh. Yeah, so if you haven't caught what we're saying yet, I mean, we're saying that in a counseling setting, absolutely, you come in with struggles, you come in with a pain and problems, and you're able to sit down in front of another person, and God uses that person to minister to you, and you walk away with an understanding of your struggle like you never had before. And amen to that. That is incredible. That is awesome. The problem is... When I start to become my own judge and jury, I start to become my own counselor, and I'm analyzing all day long, is this flesh, is this spirit, is this flesh, is this spirit. Anybody relate to that at all, or is it just us? Yeah, yeah you can find yourself, once you become aware that there are so many flavors of flesh, I mean, it's like Baskin Robbins, huh? There's 31 flavors of flesh out there, and there's good looking flavors and bad looking flavors. There's religious flesh and there's ugly looking flesh, the lying and cheating and stealing flesh. But then there's, you know, spiritual looking flesh. And you start realizing, whoa, anything could be a counterfeit for the Holy Spirit. And then you think, well, I never want that to happen again. So I'm going to be my own judge and my own jury. And I'm going to be my own referee, and I'm going to keep myself from ever walking after the flesh, because I just don't want that. I don't want that. And at that point, I've become my counselor, my judge, my jury. And, you know, even when you look at the words of, of David, he says, you search me, oh God. You search me. You see, you see if there's something going on here, because you're the God of the universe, and I am not. And as you so correctly pointed out, I mean, the Bible never says, analyze the flesh, analyze the flesh, analyze the flesh. It says, walk by the spirit and you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. So we have to come to a place where we're saying, I am willing to not serve as my judge and jury. I am willing to even not know if something is of God every moment or not. I don't have to know, but God is big and he's in me and I trust him and I'm not gonna be that guy that, that goes down the basketball court and stops every four seconds to see if the ref blew the whistle or not. I'm gonna play the game. Play the game, enjoy the game. It's relationship and God is big. Imagine if you, you know, you tapped your kids on the head every moment they ever thought anything or did anything off. I mean, you might be correcting them all day long and you'd lose relationship. And I think, you know, we can tend to think that's what God's up to. But, but God is wiser than we are and he's going to take care of our behavior, but maybe not in the way we imagine. Yeah, it, it makes me think of the verse in Isaiah where he says, he will keep in perfect peace whose mind is fixed on him. I think sometimes the way we operate, we're thinking he will keep us in perfect peace when our mind is fixed on the flesh. When we, when we can focus on the flesh and correct it and identify with it and make sure we're not walking after it. You don't walk into a dark room and cast out darkness and figure out what darkness does and try to get rid of it. You just turn on the light. You just fix your eyes on Jesus. Walk after the spirit. Walk in him. And don't even worry about the flesh. Now I'm saying that. And it sounds a lot better coming out than what we can experience when we get out in the lab, right? So there's no condemnation in whatever, wherever we are in that process. But the truth is the truth. And we're on the journey of discovering more and more this reality. It sets us free. All right, so what about this idea of let go, let God, or a similar notion, all of him and none of me? Now, some of you know that we here in Texas, we've had some pretty bad, pretty bad wildfires over the years. Um, my mom, in fact, has a place here in Texas and the wildfires, the flames got to be 200 feet tall and they came within 100 yards of her place and almost took it down. But thank God that didn't happen. But I'll tell you, fire has a tendency to just blaze its path and take down anything in its way. But there was one time in the Old Testament that that didn't happen, and that was with the burning bush. You remember that story? Talking about the presence of the Lord, it says the fire did not consume the bush. 
And I love that Old Testament story because for me, it's like a, a picture, an analogy, a reminder that God could dwell in that place without consuming that place. God could be in that place without getting rid of it. And that's the same with the indwelling of Christ, that Christ dwells in me. It's not all of Christ and none of me. It's all of me and all of Christ in a beautiful union together, right? And, and you know, when we talk about this, you know, we talked about um, brokenness last night. I, I mentioned that term, and that, that can often be misunderstood. Uh, you know, is God trying to get rid of us? Maybe not, but he's trying to break us down and tear us down and diminish us in some way. And I think we have to come back to just a, a simple insight, and that is my confidence is being broken. My confidence in the flesh is being broken because Paul said, I put no confidence in the flesh. It's not my spiritual hardware that needs cleaning or improving. It's the fact that I have some software issues in my thinking. It's not my hardware, it's my software. And it's the, the confident. You like that? That's really good. Yeah, well, I like it a lot. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, but you see the difference here. If we needed a hardware adjustment, then that would be, well, you know, we need another finished work. Guess it wasn't finished. But there is a renewing of the mind, and we're going to talk about that. And part of that renewing involves uh, being this confidence being broken. Um, because, you know, that way of living, it just doesn't work. And God wants to show us that because he loves us. Yeah, I said, I said earlier in the last session, I said, you know, it's in our heart. That's where he put it. Now it's got to travel to 18 or 20 inches up into our head, right? The renewing of the mind. But this, this very idea, is it all of him and none of me? It sounds so good. Mm. How good does that sound? Oh, it's, it's Jesus. It's all Jesus. Even to the point when people do things and you come up and say, that was great. Thank you for ministering to me. Thank you for playing that song or giving that message. Oh, it wasn't me. It, it was Jesus. And you want to say, I, I could have sworn. <laughs> I was so yeah, I mean, you were involved. Uh, yeah, it's, it's somehow. I mean, I didn't know Jesus wore a polo shirt. But... We have to understand the, the very question, the very idea, is it him or is it me, presumes maybe the greatest lie that there's a separation. And people get into passivity, too. Yes. Because if it's all of him and none of me, then I'm just going to sit on my hands and I'm going to wait. And I'm saying, grace, 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 grace. Where are you, Jesus? Yeah. And his answer to that would be, I'm already in you. I'm already with you. Let's walk. Yeah, I like to kind of play with the, the passage that says nothing is impossible with God. You know the passage? Well, we know what that means. He can do anything. But how about doing nothing is impossible when God's in you too? He's a lover, right? And I, when I do counseling sometimes, they'll ask this question as they start to learn their identity in Christ, start to learn their freedom. Then they, they really, because they've been so uh, focused on flesh patterns, they, they'll now say, well, I'm so, am I abiding? Is it me or is it Jesus? Is it me or is it Jesus? And I tell them, the new covenant is not Christ instead of you. It's Christ in you. The question presumes separation that the whole of the New Testament, the whole of the new covenant is correcting. Jesus paid too much to come inhabit us for us to keep asking the question, okay, is it just you or is it just me? There's no separation now. We are in union with our God. It is him in me and me in him. And you were telling me the other day that in your counseling situations, uh, you get that question all the time. I mean, people say, you know, okay, okay, I think I've got the message. All right, but just one question. Yeah. Is it him? Is it Christ? Or, or is it me? And the answer is yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So what about the term Christ as me? Now, again... <laughs> We said that we don't want to be grace Pharisees in terminology. I think I know what we mean when we say this. I just want to be careful because the scriptures use terms like Christ in me, Christ through me, Christ for me, that sort of thing. When I think of Christ as me, I, for me, I get the sense that I need to be replaced again, mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm not good enough, that, look, 
if I'm only seeing Christ, I'm okay. But if Tim's involved in this, mm -hmm. uh, so let's just do Christ as Tim. Let's just replace Tim. Jesus doesn't want to replace us. He wants to embrace us and work through us, live through us. He wants to love through us. And I think about being married. Can you imagine if I went to my wife and said, okay, Captain, we're in this union. I love you. You love me. This is a great thing. I want you to live as me. <laughs> I can tell you what she would say. I, I tried it for the first few years of our marriage. It didn't work. She's not real good at being me, and I'm not real good at being her. But we're pretty good at being in union. And union is not the idea of sameness. It's oneness. I didn't become her, and she didn't become me. But if you call our house and ask for a chalice, though she was not birthed with that name, she is just as legitimate to answer by that name now as I am, because I gifted it to her. She received it fully. We live in and through that union. But she doesn't have to live as me, and I don't have to live as her. We're unique, but in union. So it, it kind of reminds me of the Jesus glasses. You know, if we took this the long way, then we might say, you know, God is looking at me through the Jesus glasses and he sees Jesus instead of me. And so then when it comes to the living, it needs to be Christ as me. And, you know, some people could get the wrong idea. They get the idea that, you know, we're all going to be Jesus clones. We all end up exactly like Jesus with no diversity and variety. And what I love about this is that what we're really saying is everyone in this room is a unique canvas. And God has never painted on these canvases ever before in human history. And the master painter is loving every minute of it. And he gets to paint the brush strokes of his life on your canvas. But the difference is, is that each canvas in itself is unique. Our personality traits, our sense of humor, what we like to do, what we don't like to do, who we really are at the personality level is totally embraced by God. And so it, it's like the end goal becomes different. It's not that I need to avoid as if I were an obstacle as we were saying earlier, we, we really see that we're an instrument and that we're compatible, that we're part of the equation and that God loves our uniqueness. And can I just add to this? If we're image bearers of him, and we are, can you imagine the vast variety of image bearers that it continues to, that God is painting this canvas and we're so unique and different yet we share the same light? To give some depiction of this vast God whose image we bear. He's this multifaceted of one. And he offers that to us in the canvas of our life. I love Ephesians 2.10. He, he is the, the master and we are the workmanship. And the word there literally is that we are his poem. He is, he is writing this beautiful poem through our lives. And each one is unique and each one is special. <coughs> The most boring thing on this planet is religion because it tries to conform us all to be the same. God uniquely is expressing his same life through each one of us individually. And it's a beautiful expression. Now, this, this next question has to do with the status of our soul. And, you know, for me, I early on in my life, I had a different understanding of my soul than I do now. And my early understanding of soul was that my soul is essentially dirty and that God is cleaning it up. Now, my spirit is clean, but my soul is dirty. That's what I thought. And so then I struggled with the, the logic of that, the truthfulness of that, because remember, your soul goes to heaven, right? Not just your spirit, but your soul. Your soul is heaven ready. So if the Lord were to come back in this moment, or if you were to pass away physically and go to heaven, your soul would go with you. And there's, as I said the other night, there's not a moment that I know of in Scripture where God is waiting for you at the door of heaven to get out his solical 409 and spray you off and clean up your soul right before you enter to be with him forever. So what's up 
with the soul. I mean, that's what we're asking. Clearly, I experience sin in the soul. I can harbor resentment. I can harbor anger. I make choices with my will. My emotions are affected. Sinful thoughts come in. I entertain them. And I would say that the soul is, is very much like this room. Think about this room for a minute. If we were to open that door over there, which we shouldn't. <laughs> and then if we were to sin twice by opening this door as well, well, guess what's going to happen? Here in Texas, if you give it enough time, well, there's going to be a little breeze coming through. And then there's going to be some dust and dirt coming through. And if you wait long enough, you know, all kinds of things, leaves, animals, lots of things could come through these doors. Our soul is like an experienced tank. Our soul can experience anything, but our soul doesn't give us our spiritual nature. And so when we get to heaven, our soul will only experience heaven. We won't be influenced by the power of sin and the world and the flesh and the devil. <coughs> So it's not that our soul in itself is dirty or sinful or evil. And I think that's dangerous, Tim, because I think that when we decide our spirit is righteous and then our soul is ugly and dirty, then we've got a fight that's almost like a civil war, but we've got new labels for it. Instead of old man versus new man, it becomes spirit versus soul. And we're afraid of the soulical life we're afraid of the soul. The soul becomes a dirty word. And apparently the good news is gooder than that. <laughs> it really is. And I love this analogy of the breeze flowing through here. What's going to follow through that, right? The soul's a, how do you say it? A expression? It's an experience. Tank. Experience. Yeah. Tank. I like that. If the soul is dirty, let's, let's, let's take the, the converse. If the soul is dirty, then my question would be, what cleans it up to make it heaven ready? What would clean it? If the soul is dirty right now, and it has to be clean to go to heaven, and we would all agree our soul's going to heaven, right? I mean, it, we're, we're dealing with God stuff here, but, but Drew just said, your soul's going to heaven because it's going with you. Yeah, it's because it, it is you. It's not all of you, but it is you, right? right? And so if the soul is dirty right now, what would be cleaning it up? What's going to make it heaven ready? It would have to be. And then you got the question of, well, can you go to heaven with a 72% clean soul? Exactly. exactly. If, exactly. It's, if it's in process. If, what, if Jesus' finished work hasn't cleaned us body, soul, and spirit, then we're in trouble. So the effective work of Jesus, I heard that breath. The effective work of Jesus is what makes our soul heaven ready. We're not cleaning up our soul by renewing our mind. We're renewing our mind that we have been made clean. And we want that experience within our soul. I'm not saying the soul doesn't experience messes. It does. Drew said so. He said he gets bad thoughts there. And he entertains them. I was surprised. <laughs> but it happens. It happens. And, and, but that doesn't make the soul dirty. Right? It doesn't make the soul dirty. Another way to look at it would be, you know, what if the soul is like a mirror? Okay? Now imagine this is a mirror, and the soul uh, could reflect sin, or it could reflect God. It could reflect the flesh, or it could reflect the spirit. But the mirror is not the problem. The problem is not the nature of the mirror. The problem is what we're choosing to reflect in that moment. And there are times that our chooser, that our mind gets deceived, and we decide to reflect this over here because we think it's going to work for us. And then God is saying, no, 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 that's not your destiny. That's not your calling. That's not your heart. As you reflect me, you're also reflecting who you are at the core. So... The default setting, the most natural, the most normal thing is to reflect Christ from the inner core of our being. But sometimes people see other things from us, don't they? They're looking in the mirror of our soul and they see yucky stuff reflected right back at them. 
and they're thinking yucky thoughts about us, but if they could do a little heart surgery, put us on their spiritual operating table and look at the core of our being, they would see that at that moment we're reflecting something that doesn't really reflect who we are at the core. The problem is not the mirror, it's what the mirror reflects. So as you look at this diagram then, consider that, what if I get my spiritual nature from my spirit? <clears throat> That's not rocket science, is it? What if I get my spiritual nature from my spirit? And what if my soul and body are tools, instruments, something that can be offered to sin in a given moment or offered to God in a given moment? But there's nothing wrong with the soul itself. That's really important to see that God embraces you fully, right? Yeah, otherwise we start cutting ourselves up into parts. Acceptable parts to God, unacceptable parts to God. I think we do this inadvertently. And we make some really clear distinctions on some things that I think the Scripture is talking to Drew about. this. I think the Scripture says that it takes the Word of God to make these distinctions as clearly as we sometimes are trying to make them. We're not trying to answer everything here. And we're taking a microscope and looking at some of these distinctive features of the body, the soul, and the spirit. But we have to be honest. We are a whole being. We are one whole being. And in the image of God, who is three in one, we are also three in one. When we start taking apart ourselves, the only purpose in doing that, I think, that's very beneficial is in order to receive all of us, to accept all of me as God does. Otherwise, even because I did this for years, I thought my spirit was clean and the rest of me was dirty. And so no matter how much I was hearing, I'm righteous in Christ, I'm righteous in Christ, I'm telling you, my behavior, my feelings, even my mindset was saying something very different. My experiences were saying something very different. And it takes a work. It takes a renewing of the mind, which is coming up, in order to really agree with God, even over and against how we might feel based on any given moment. So if you felt like a compartment of you is holy, then this section is for you. If you have felt like a part of you is holy, a compartment of you is righteous, then there's some good news. And that is that God embraces you Body, soul, and spirit being holy and acceptable to him. So what about renewing of the mind? Well, this, this is, to me, the call of the New Testament to the believer. We have been made new. Now set your mind in that tree. Right? Romans 12 says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, this gravitational pull that the world has in it. Right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a command. And so what happens is, as we renew our mind to these realities that Jesus has accomplished on our behalf, that he is our life, that we are righteous, that he is pleased with us, he accepts not just a part of me, he accepts all of me. I can find anybody to accept bits and pieces of me. I did that all my life. And I hid the part that I didn't think they would accept. We don't have to do that with God. We can be ourselves. He gives us the freedom to be free again. And so now... I can renew my mind to that truth. Now, it's a work, right? But it's a worthwhile venture to continue to fix our eyes on Jesus and take what he placed in our heart and let it travel that distance into our mind. And we continue to renew our mind. Because it doesn't say the truth shall set you free in John 8. It says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we've got to continue to renew our mind to this truth. So I, I bought a computer not too long ago. I guess it's been a decade and a half now that, uh, yeah, now that I think about it. Yeah. And I was in Best Buy, and I was so familiar with PCs, and the Mac was the new shiny product in town. And uh, so I decided that I would buy this, this Mac, and I brought it home, and I had it for all five minutes. I turn it on, and I'm thinking, look at this shiny new hardware and within five minutes I need a software update and I'm thinking I just bought this thing right I just bought it I think what we're saying is 
We've, we've got that shiny new hardware. Each one of us is a mobile device working our way around the planet. But let's be honest, some, sometimes there's a download that we need to choose. In our thinking, there are downloads. But you know as well as I do that when that download, when that software update is offered, there's a little X that you could click and say, nah, I'll pass. Or you can click and accept that and get the software update. So as we look at who we are, we're differentiating software from hardware, and we're saying, you've got the new hardware, but those software updates, keep them coming, Lord, keep them coming, because I need them. But those software updates, they don't determine my nature. I mean, even Jesus himself, it says that he grew in wisdom and stature, and we may be learning things and growing even into eternity, Beyond this life on planet Earth, we're, we're going to be learning and growing and getting to know the Lord better, learning more about the facets of all that he is. That means that learning doesn't affect my righteousness and that the new thoughts that come to me don't determine my nature. You will never exhaust what God is offering. Not on this side for sure and not even on the other side. When you think of eternity and you think, do you think we, we will have arrived? What we will be is face to face. But do you think there will ever be a day where we stop learning of how much he has been loving us all along? We will never go, oh, I, I, I tapped into it. I finished it all. I'm at the bottom of your love, Lord. I see it. Every day for all eternity. And there's no even way to fathom this because we're using time reference for something that is timeless. He will be communicating and showing you how much he's always been loving you. This everlasting love. And so what do we do on this side of it? Keep renewing our mind to that. All right. Well, the last question we want to address is, is the body, the physical shell that we live in. And, um, you know, what I want to say about this is that early on, there was a group called Gnostics. The Gnostics were infiltrating the early church and basically teaching that this body is evil. And so you had a lot of Christians who had the wrong impression. They were rejecting their physicality. A lot of people were even pushing the false idea that Jesus didn't have a real physical body. And of course, we know that he did. And anyone who says that he didn't, uh, John calls that anti-Jesus, anti-Christ, to say that Christ did not come in this physical shell that we also share. So... It's interesting how when we know that flesh is the opponent, somehow that gets wrapped up as body. And then some of us, if we're just tasting the message or if we've gotten the wrong impression, we might think that the body is the enemy. And I guess, uh, Tim, what we're saying is, again, the body is not the enemy. The soul is not the opponent. Of course, the spirit is not either. And so the, the big takeaway is that God fully and, and wholly and completely embraces all of who we are. And yes, our body and soul can be used as a parasite uh, called sin, might infiltrate our thinking and act through us. But we need to know that there's nothing wrong with the instrument itself. It's just a question of, am I offering my body to sin or am I offering my body to God because it's holy and acceptable? Am I setting my mind on sin or am I setting my mind on things of the spirit? But there is nothing wrong with my body, soul or spirit. And that is a big message because we can say God accepts me all day long. And then run away with bad ideas about, well, really, it's just a part of me. So, so you're saying he likes my body. Yeah. He likes this thing. It's me that sometimes doesn't like it. Right? He likes our body. And I, and I do think it's a not so subtle form of Gnosticism to talk about he's pleased with my spirit. He's, he's okay with that. He's made it righteous. But then to reject our body, where the scripture says... This body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and you are holy. He's totally pleased with all of us, with all of you. And then when I think of, you know, the different definitions for what the Bible is, you know what I think the Bible is? It's God's address book. Throughout the Old and New Testament, it tells us where he lives. 
He lives in us. Body, soul, and spirit. He lives in our whole being. And Romans 8 says, The God who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal subject to death. This body is subject to death, but it's not evil. That he will give life to your mortal body by faith. So he's expressing his life through all of us. One whole being. Well, let's, uh, let's pray together and thank our God. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the truth that always sets us free. That you are crazy about us. That you are completely in love with us. And that we can embrace this truth and not try to explain it away or compartmentalize it or make it about a part of us. But you have announced that body, soul, and spirit, you are not seeking to replace us, but you want to totally embrace us. We love you, Father. We thank you for this message. We thank you for your son, Jesus.